Good morning. My name is Theron Cole. This is BelieversFoundationMinistries.com. Today is January 8th, 2024. We are in a new year here, the year of our Lord. I'm giving the email address because our website, we are in a transition right now with that website. We um, had some glitches that we have to fix and it may take a little while to fix them, but I'm grateful that we discovered that we had one, a glitch. We were not receiving emails from those of you who may have emailed us. We've been getting emails directly to that website, but not from, excuse me, directly to the email site, the, the Gmail account that I'm going to give you. We've been getting emails that have been emailed directly to that Gmail account. However, not from the actual website. Something happened and there was a disruption. So um, I'm going to give you this Gmail account uh, so that you'll have it and you can email if you like. B as in boy, foundation, F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N, ministries, M-I-N-I-S-T-R-I-E-S, at gmail.com. Okay, so that's a way that you can reach us if you need to. We have been discussing the God particle. The last time we were together, we talked about it. We're going to be discussing it again today. Uh, there's so much in this. There's so much of God's word in this. Physics is a language of God. Now, physics is, is a, a subject matter that discovers, physics discovers laws by which certain areas of life operate by. These operations that govern our life, that are discovered in physics, are laws that God has put in place. God is talking all the time to us, but are we listening? It's very easy to put a great deal of traditional thinking on what is understood, commonly understood, about physics at this, in the year 2024, and so that we would say, oh, well, that's just this, or that's just that, um, by way of giving an explanation to something that makes it very ordinary and very common. But God is not common, and God is not ordinary. And everything that we try to attach an ordinary essence to isn't ordinary at all. We are in an utterly miraculous place. It is a devising of God. He invented all of this. He put it all together. And we work very, very hard to try to look at it as ordinary. And there's a reason why we do this. It's because of fear. We are very fearful creatures. We are so terribly afraid that the moment we begin to realize that there is so much that we don't understand and that what you think you understand is ordinary, you don't understand at all. That frightens a lot of people. Well, I will say this about coming to God. It takes intestinal fortitude to truly come to God. It takes intestinal fortitude to truly take a look at his creation and determine that you don't know anything about it at all. How about you learn? Well, there's many ways to learn. The best way is to ask God, to ponder the things that he's done, and to ask him, and he'll answer you. What I have found about his answers is that sometimes he answers you through situations that you're dealing with all the time, situations that are common to you. And he will begin to answer you according to the deep things through the common things, through what you think is common. We have to find our peace in him. 
We do not order our universe. We give that to him to order. Oh, that's like being in free fall. You're going to let God do this, not you, God. God is going to order your universe. Okay. Trusting him. Ooh, free fall. That means you can't manipulate. You can't try to control all this stuff around you that you can't really control anyway. Now, you do have to make an order out of your life, a harmony out of your life. You do. And God will show you how to do that too. Harmony and order are vital. We have been given, the scripture says, an ability to live a godly and a peaceable life in this present evil age. But God is a consummate instructor and a teacher without compare. <laughs> he is incredible. He teaches you all the time. And the more you want to learn, if you lap it up, he'll give you more and more and more. He'll repeat things, but he never repeats things exactly the same way. It's always repeated just a little differently because he wants you to get it, and he's going in deeper. You see, God's going for the gold. He's going for your heart. He's got to get to your heart. You have to get to your heart. You can only get to your heart through God. And God can't get to your heart without you. So right there you have your first cooperative. You and God. And no matter how it looks in your life right now, no matter how alone you may think you are, the truth is we are all alone. No matter how much we are surrounded by others, we are all alone. There's nobody inside of me but me and God. And once you have him, you have a constant companion, the Holy Spirit with you forever, inside. He won't let you go. He talks to you, teaches you. You're not alone. Having people around you just makes you not feel alone. But the truth is, we are all alone. It's just some are more aware of it than others. But we are all alone. And with God. If you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you have him. And you, in cooperation with him, are becoming a very strong new creation, the likes of which has never been before. Okay, we're gonna go to the Lord. Father, we desire to hear from heaven today, from your heart. We desire that you open our eyes to new things. We desire that the darkness be penetrated and the light shine. Father, I ask that all that which would resist the light be vanished, repelled. Lord, let your light shine and give us a will to receive it and a heart to love you and a heart to love what you love. and a heart to hate evil. That is sometimes the hardest of all, Lord, because the people are so afraid. Perfect love casts out fear. Your perfect love casts out fear, Lord. Lord, we desire to have you as our all in all. So engraft yourself to us deeply and open our hearts to you mightily and give us a song to sing that never dies. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, God is love. The scripture says that. God is also light and he's life. The three L's. <laughs> love, light, and life. 
So by way of a quick review, because I am not going to get into the scientific aspects of these things I'm telling you any more than to point out a few of the major points that I believed we need to ponder, but also to excite you to look into this yourself. There's so much on Google that's written, so much that's been put uh, on the web to read about the atom and about the subatomic particles that you can look at them yourselves. They testify of God. <laughs> he loves to testify about himself and he does constantly in everything that he makes. He is a uh, a living testification of himself. He is incredible. And therefore, as much of him as you receive, as much of him as you take in, as much of him as you adore, you are becoming a new creation. Okay, we're going to focus on that. Now, just some thoughts that I don't know that if I shared last time. The atoms come together for different reasons. They repel other atoms, they pull in other atoms, they bond with certain atoms, and they become molecules which become elements. Now the primary elements that we all have studied are what, are what make up the, the basis or the, the structure, the strata of our substance, of the substance of our world oxygen, hydrogen, you know, and the list goes on. There are many of them. I think those are the only two I've mentioned. But there are many. You have all of the metals. You've got silver and gold. and I mean, it just goes on, and there's quite a few. And how many are actually on the table? I don't know. And if I give a number, I might fail the test. So I'm not going to give a number. Um, but there are quite a few. Okay, so each one of these is identified by their atomic structure. It has a structure. Each of these elements has a structure. That structure is inviolate. It holds. That structure has boundaries. There's a beginning and an end to that structure. There's the existence of the substance or not. When it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. The atoms aren't there. When it does, it does. Now these all seem like simple things, but they're profound. And they're profound because this tells you about God. God is about order. He's about structure. He's about identity. He's about substance. And he's about boundaries. Everything that God creates has boundaries. And you can take a look around you, and you can see that. You can read Genesis, and you'll hear it coming out of his mouth. He creates barriers for things to be an end of. You know, um, I don't live near the ocean, and I don't have the ocean overcoming me because the ocean has a boundary, and its boundary exists well before it gets to me. I love the ocean. I'd like to have, you know, more time at the ocean. But the ocean has a place to be, and that's where it is. Everything has boundaries. The sky has boundaries. The earth has boundaries. We have boundaries. And God has given us the Emmanuel. <laughs> Emmanuel is with us. Yes, so Emmanuel is our Emmanuel, and it is the book. the book. The book is the written draft which prepared the people for the coming one. It was a bit of structure that God put in place to help hold his people together in a certain way long before the Savior came, continuously testifying of himself. You cannot study all of this and come away godless. It's impossible. And, well, let me put it this way. It is impossible for any of God's chosen to come away 
godless. Many of the chosen haven't been awakened yet. There is an awakening process that needs to happen to the people of God. The dead will never awaken, the truly dead. And there are truly dead. There are the walking dead among us. They exist. They will never wake up to God. They are not gods. Exactly as we are told, the Lord speaks about um, a field that is sown with seed. He sows good seed, the sower does. But when he awakens and the seed has come up, he sees that there's other stuff there. An enemy has done this, he says. But he doesn't pull up the other seed until the last of the last days. He lets it grow up along with everything else. So in great part, we do not know who the walking dead are. And you have to treat every individual as though, because every individual is entitled to this, as though he's a sleeping child of God. And you give what God has you to give to that person to awaken them. You talk to them about God. You witness his majesty. And if they can hear the call and awaken, then so be it. But some will never. And that's the way it is. So we can't fight with that one. It just exists. It is the way it is. Now the atom was discovered in the early 1800s. And it's taken a long time of looking at it, studying it, pondering it, to begin to dissect it. Because the atom's pretty tiny. But as I said before, it's a proton which has a positive, is a positive gives off a positive charge. A neutron gives off no charge. And the proton and the neutron bond together. And they form the nucleus of the atom. And circulating around the outside is the electron. The electron is a negative charge. Now these hold together like a little teeny tiny universe. They hold, or a star system, like a little tiny star system. They hold together and then connect and do their formations according to what and how and why. Well, it's according to God's word, of course, but it hasn't been seen. The scientists knew there was something else there, these subatomic particles, but didn't know how to find them, couldn't get at them. They knew they existed, but they weren't able to be seen at that time, but they persisted. So, in 1964, I believe that the quarks and the gluons were discovered. Now, the gluons were what make the protons stick together. Aha! So the protons can stick together because of these little subatomic particles, much smaller than atoms. The quarks are bound together by the gluons. So the gluons make up the protons and the neutrons, apparently. And the quarks are then bound together by the gluons. Okay, so the gluons hold the quarks together, and then the gluons also make up protons and the neutrons. It's kind of amazing. So they have found these things, and this is what they call them. God is amazing. We can never catch up to him. He will always be ahead of us. <laughs> and we can only hope to catch little bits here and there. And hopefully, as we continue to morph into the creation that he has us to be, we will be able to contain more of him. But we are a creation of his as well. So whatever it is you think of yourself, and I realize that maybe is a kind of a scary thought because you sort of think of yourself as, well, you. Well, what is a you? 
He made the you. That's an awesome thought. I like to keep things small. Because when you understand things in the small, the big is right there looming. The big can only be seen truly in the terms of the small. So you are pretty small in the terms of all things, but you have an ability as a child of God to make a connection with God that makes you greater than you can possibly imagine. And you can't imagine it. And because you have that power, you are dangerous until you're trained. So it's extremely important to get yourself in a position of being obedient because that will help keep you from being dangerous. So for a period of time, while we're developing, we are dangerous. And not dangerous in a way that would make us happy if we knew. We are causing problems. We are creating disorder. We are ruining and damaging things and don't actually realize it because we are grappling with leaving an old life behind and laying hold of the new and we don't understand how powerful we are and how much ammo we've been given. We have a lot of ammo, powerful ammo. Excuse me. By the time you realize how much damage you can cause, very often it's way down the road. So I would caution everyone to proceed cautiously. And when you get born again and saved, my, it should be a sign that says proceed with caution. Obey God. Turn to Him to get His instructions. We're going to meditate on that one just in a little bit. We're going to really get into that. God is so amazing. Now, I'm going to give you physics of the spirit. And are there physics of the spirit? Yes, there are. And there are many things that people have not seen, and then there are some things that some people have seen. The Lord has given us all instructions that what the things you see in secret, what you've been told in secret, you're to shout from the rooftops. And I am endeavoring to do that, okay? And I have seen some things in secret, and I will shout them from the rooftops. One of them is, and these are things God has taught me and shown me and has been revealed to me. This is a deep thing. Everything talks. There is communication with everything. Now, you can't see it, you don't know about it. There are elements of that communication that over a period of years have been revealed by scientists, which is very confirming, and there are things about that communication that you don't hear anymore. It bubbles up and everybody's excited for a little while and then they go away. It's what I call the dog in the mirror syndrome. If you take a dog, or a, a puppy, or a regular dog who's never seen a mirror, and you put the animal in front of the mirror, they get real excited. Oh, this is great, a friend. And that lasts for just as long as that animal begins to realize that what's reacting in the mirror isn't reacting normally. And then they get confused by it and a little scared. And then they don't want to look at it. And then you'll pick them up and have them look at it and they'll turn away right away. That's what people do when they see something that doesn't register with their own frame of reference. Okay, well, the eternal doesn't register with your frame of reference. I'll just say that. It's going to be outside of your frame of reference. So you must be exactly what Joshua 1.9 says. You must be courageous and don't be afraid. Now, how do you do that? Well, when fear tries to come up, you push it down. And maybe you take a break. I've had a couple of things that God has done with me that have scared me sufficiently that I couldn't go back to them. 
which is really sad because it was a power. One of them occurred in prayer, where I was praying, got into deep, what I called deep prayer, and I was, I was in that room there with that child that I didn't know. I was in the room, and it frightened me. And I pulled back, and I couldn't do it after that. I was scared. See, he has given us a marvelous ability in him, by him, for things you can't possibly imagine. And he will use you in ways you can't possibly imagine. Everything talks. OK. It was discovered many years ago that plants would respond to the thoughts of people. And they tested it by, have, they had some very sensitive equipment that could test the, the wave patterns somehow that plants give out. I'm vague on this, but that study should still be out there. Google probably has it. And people would come into the room with the intention of killing that plant, and the plant would register that they, could, they were picking up the signals from the plant that the plant understood what the person had in mind. Now, they couldn't go in there with just the intent to fake the plant. It had to be a real intent to do the plant in. OK, everything talks. Now, you're not hearing the communication, but it talks. God has put himself into all of his creation. There is a testifying of himself in everything. And God's a talker. <laughs> you are never going to out-talk God. <laughs> You're never going to wear him down. I thought if there was somebody who could wear him down, it would be me, but it's not true. Romans. We're going to read this in the King James because sometimes the King James, this is what I've learned about the King James. And I love the King James for different reasons. Now, sometimes the translation, other translators, other translators are so good. Not all, but most. Most of the translations out there are wonderful. And I like to put them all together because they'll give you different slants. The Word of God is like a jewel. It's like Jesus hanging from the cross. He glittered with love. Many different facets of what was going on in him was sending out incredible rays of light. Things happened while he hung on that cross. The love of God glitters. His word glitters. It glows. It's like a light. It's, it has facets, and it shines in different directions, and God's Word is like that, like shards of light. And we are light receptors and light containers and light giver offers. And we will pick up those rays of light at some point that will, elements of it will speak to us more than, because it depends on who we are and what we were made like. And each one of us is unique, which is absolutely incredible. God doesn't make uh, anything exactly the same. Everything he makes is unique. Everything. Which is incredible. Romans 8, verse 22. Now this is Paul talking. We know that the whole creation has been grown. Oh, I was not to do that. I have to read this in the King James. Please excuse me. Um, I started to go into another translation. I'm sorry. Um, and I needed exactly this one. OK. All right, Romans 8, 22. For we know the whole creation groaneth, now that's a sound. And travaileth. Now in French, travail, travail is work. 
its effort. That the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Everything's in pain. Why is that? Because the earth has fallen as well when man fell. Okay, so man and the earth are tied together. Now, how we are tied together is very difficult to say. But we are also told that the earth will release and yield her produce, her, her, herself, to those of us who are her children, to our, those of us who are the children of God. And we get recognized by the earth as a child of God. So she treats us like her children too. And she gives forth of her substance to us. Now that is in the word and that is a promise. Okay, so how do you hunt the face of God? You hunt him in his promises. You hunt him in his creation. We are to be hunting him. There's so many things to see about him. It's It's a wonderland. God has created something so much better than Disneyland or any of these other entertainment parks. That's just a, a wasting of our time or a, an occupation of our time, or maybe a little bit of fun, but investigating what God has done is eternal. Now what you get from God, you get to keep. And the devil can't steal it from you unless you let him. Jesus had a conversation one time with Martha when he was at the house of Lazarus, his friend. And Mary was sitting at his feet, listening to what he had to say. We don't know what he was saying. I would have loved to have known what he was saying to her. But it was personal, I believe. But it was also deeply spiritual, eternal. And Martha was upset because she was having to do all the work by herself. And he said, oh, Martha, he said, you're, you're worried, stressing about many things. But he said, Mary has chosen the better part and it won't be taken from her. Okay. So you get to keep what you get from God. If you really get it from God, you get to keep it. If you keep it, that's the caveat, because it can be thrown away, and you can allow another to steal it if you disregard it and treat it lightly. So those are sins that you can commit that actually will cause you to lose what you've been given. And uh, we've already begun to tap in a little bit to Esau and Jacob. Esau did that, threw away his birthright, okay? There are things like that happening in our culture. I see women doing this, throwing away a birthright, which they began to do in the 60s, 1960s. You can throw away something that God has given you for something that you think is better, but proves to be a lie. So right there, you see, creation groaneth. Aha, a noise. Okay, Luke 19. Starting in verse 37. Um... Okay, 36. <laughs> oh, all right. 34. Oh, all right. 32. So those who were sent out and found it just as Jesus told them. Now, this is where they've hunted. His disciples are hunting for a colt. And Jesus told them where to go. It was already prepared. Ah. 
As they were untying the coat, its owners asked, why are you untying the coat? And Jesus had already given them the answer. The Lord needs it, they answered. And that's what the Lord told them to say. And then they led the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks over it, and put Jesus on it. And as he rode along, the people spread their cloaks on the road. And as he approached the descent from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples, the whole multitude of disciples, the Lord had a lot of disciples. We hear predominantly about the twelve, but there were many others. The whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees, because they're the finger pointers, there's the, they're the critiquers, they're the ones who are not going to be they're not going to be undone by the Spirit of God. Oh, no, they've got a better way to go. Kind of like the devil, the five I wills, given in Isaiah. They've got another way to go. But it's artificial. But some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he answered, if they remain silent, the very stones will cry out. Aha, you probably didn't know stones could talk. Well, there you are. All right now, do they talk all the time? Well, it is a type of speech and a type of talking that's going on that makes you who you are. The human body talks all the time to itself, the different parts. The stones are communicating in order to hold. There's a communication going on there. Now, do you know what that communication is? No, you don't. So you don't know its language. You don't know its speech. You don't know. You don't know. There's so much we don't know. We don't know. But the little bit that we do know about the human body has told us that your body, in times of need or throughout the day, will give off signals to the glands and hormones are released at various times. You, you are unaware that this is even going on, and yet your body is talking constantly. Your intestines are talking, and sometimes you are aware of that. Yes. There's a great deal going on in your body that is talking. You might try giving it the Word of God directly. Talk to it. What you infill and indwell, what you allow yourself to be indwelt with by filling yourself with through the hearing of the ears will talk to your body. So intentionally talk to your body. You have a part that hurts, you talk to that part and you call it peace, you give it peace, and you talk to it and you soothe it, you give it God's word, it'll be like a balm, but you keep it up if it doesn't react right away. Your body is actually designed to listen to you. What you say and what you believe affects your body because your body's always talking and you are the head of the body. And he, the Lord Jesus, is the head of you. So when you talk what he says, your body will be better for it and will become nourished as a result of it in ways you cannot imagine. You have to trust him. He knows better than you and he knows more than you. And one thing that I've learned about obedience to God is that he does not convince you ahead of time of why. He just says, this is what you do. Because you can't understand well enough and he is not going to try to convince you. He just wants you to obey him. Okay. Now, 
Your body can defend itself. If intruders come in, your body is designed. It has a, um, a, defensory, a defensive system. Um, it has a sensory system and a defensive system, whereby it can defend itself to some degree against intruders. And when those intruders come in, then antibodies are released and different things occur in order to fight them off. And up to a certain point, your body will do a valiant job of doing that very thing. Now, in 1977, there was a large hadron collider, 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 something to make collisions, <laughs> a particle accelerator that was invented. Now what it does, and this is, you know, I'm sure the scientists, if they were to hear my explanation, would be cringing, but um, in terms of the layman's layman, so we're getting down here to the simplest of, what it did was it gave an ability for to the scientists for the first time to be able to shoot atoms at each other and explode them and to see what happened. They wanted to see what occurred. They needed to be able to, they, they had surmised that there was other, that there were other things, subatomic particles that they didn't know of yet and they wanted to discover what was in there. So by exploding them and taking a look to see the, about the aftermath, they believed they would get a better idea as to what was in there. And so in July, uh, on July 4th, 2012, the Higgs boson was discovered and it basically is the God particle. It is a a particle that gives almost all other particles their mass, which is their density. And density doesn't have to do with size. Density has to do with intensity of substance, compressed. Kind of like if you were to hold a piece of lead or a piece of styrofoam the same size lead in one hand the size of a baseball and styrofoam in the other hand the size of a baseball, you would be amazed at how much heavier the lead was. That's because the lead has more mass. Okay, well, they found this tiniest of tiny things, so tiny I don't believe they can still see it, but what they did was they revealed it. That was my understanding, was that its nature was revealed. And so there were certain things that they began to discover about it. Uh, and I am going to continue to call it the God particle because God is testifying through this particle so much. So what density is, density is the mass per unit volume of a substance. I'm sure that makes it easier to understand. <laughs> so that's what density is. It is the mass per unit volume of a substance. Okay. So mass is the, the, the weight of it, the substance of it. And the last time we spoke on this, I turned you toward the end of the teaching to the book of Daniel and what was written on the wall to the king or the king substitute whereby he was weighed in the balances and found wanting. You see, God is a, uh, he's a fruit inspector, he's a heart inspector. He's looking for substance. He wants weight. There's a certain type of weight that only occurs in the eternal, that only occurs in his kingdom. You can't get into his kingdom without a degree of weight. And all that which doesn't have the weight will be found wanting. And it will go to the trash bin, sadly. But that's the truth of it. So, we want more weight. We want our heart to be a heart of substance. God's substance, 
his way. You can't just make this stuff up or let your opinion be the thing that rules you. Otherwise, you will lose. You've got to want to know what God wants. And you've got to want to know what God wants for you. Nobody can want for you. God, ha God does. He tells us, I know the thoughts I have for you, toward you. This is Jeremiah. I know the thoughts I have toward you. That of a future and a hope. So in him, he's got it laid out for you if you're in him. Trust him. He's got a way for you to go. So this particular Higgs boson God particle is called a force carrier, which is fascinating to me. There you are. May the force be with you. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> God is the only force in truth that I recognize. There are other forces out there. There are many forces out there, and many of them are not God. So you have to be able to recognize God's force, God's power, God's spirit. All right. This is a force carrier. It has 130 times, and we already went over this, but I'm going over it again, more mass. It is 130 times more massive than a proton. 130 times. Now, it's smaller, but it has more mass than a proton. 125 billion electron vote, volts, volts. The little electron that is circling the nucleus of the atom which is the proton and the neutron together, that gives off a charge. Okay, so it is moving like a tiny universe around the nucleus, and it has energy. This, this thing has 125 billion of those electron volts, okay? That's how much power it carries. And the part that fascinates me the very most about all of this is that this little tiny thing has no need of a charge. It appears to be self-contained with the power that it has. At this point, they see no way and have no understanding of any way that this little, ever so tiny particle gets juice from anything else. What is it? God is love. God is light. And God is life. This little thing has all the juice it needs to do the job. And it is giving substance, this little subatomic particle, it is giving substance to the atoms, who then give substance to the particles, who then give substance to the elements. What are we looking at? <laughs> it's another word, another language of God. He's talking to us. He's talking to us. Now, there are some people that are kind of geniuses in the realm of physics, and they kind of get it. What are they getting? Well, they're gifted in a language of God. And maybe they acknowledge God in their lives, and maybe they don't. But they understand something of that language. Mathematics is a language of God. Perfect. Mathematics. Amazing. God gives us in Scripture dimensions for different things that he wants constructed. 
just so far this way and just so far that way. And, and he's talking to us all the time. The mathematics is deeper than just the numbers and the distances. He's talking to us on a deeper level that we don't understand yet. But those distances and the relationship of those distances to one another, he's talking and telling us things that we don't yet get. God is brilliant, 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 brilliant. So much more brilliant that it would just, I know it would just burn us to a crisp to be in the presence of that. So we have a ways to go. We've got to reach ourselves out. We're just, we're like a little amoeba right now with regard to God. Now, I'm going to read this again because I read this last time. But you know, a good teacher repeats. And a good teacher repeats and repeats and repeats, but a good teacher also makes it so that each time you hear it, you're hearing it just a little bit of a different way. So it gets in there a little bit better. But God repeats. God repeats and repeats and repeats. And he repeats in different ways at different times. And he says it again and again and again because he is patient and he is a supreme instructor. Verse 3 of Hebrews 1. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. Well, if that's true, and he is the exact representation, that's not a copy. That is the real thing. It's an exact thing. It's not a duplicate per se. It is the one in another. That's what it was for Jesus. And that is what is happening with us. The one in another. He is engrafting himself into us. He engrafted himself and he is engrafting himself. So we are saved and being saved. And the scripture bears this out. There are many scriptures on this. You're to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And that means proceed with caution. You are dealing with forces and powers for which you have very little, if any, understanding. And you are dangerous now. Be faithful to God and he will be faithful to you and the damage that you cause while you're here will be less. Okay. You're more powerful than you know and you don't know how to behave unless you obey. And when you get things on a whim, impulsive, or you're presumptuous to the word of God, that is disobeying, and you don't want to go there. And that's how we behaved in our former life, when we were formerly slaves to corruption, slaves to the devil. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. He's the light and the exact representation of his nature upholding all things by his powerful word, or I prefer the King James, the word of his power. The word is powerful, but the power is in him. The power, you see, is in God. So the King James has it rightly here, I believe. It is a powerful word. The words are powerful because they are engaged by him. He empowers them but it is the word of his power. So the power is paramount, and the word comes forth from that. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The sins had to be cleared away so that we could have a chance, and emphasis on a chance to grasp hold, to grasp hold tightly enough that we don't let go. We're to hold.
So he upholds all things by the word of his power. Atoms form relationships that make substance what it is. And you only think that you're leaning on something that's solid. Truth is, if you got down there with a high-powered microscope, they say there's so many empty spaces that most of the substance that you look at is actually empty space. It could be compressed or made dense, or the mass could be increased by making it much smaller. But to our natural eye, everything that we have around us looks solid, but it isn't, apparently. There's vast lands in between. So atoms follow God's words. God's words. So, like I said, you've got to be bold and courageous to take a real good look because it's going to change the way that you, God's truth will change the way you look at everything. And that needs to be done because the way that you look at everything from the old man's eyes, the way that you looked at everything before you came to God, is not the way that you can continue to look at everything. So, the laws of physics proclaim God's work and His ways. He testifies of Himself in everything that He does. <laughs> He's amazing. Now, the God particle in the building of something, God is constructing something that we can't see. We can't see it, but we're part of it. We are looking at it through an historical perspective when we look at it, and we don't get to see it from the top down. And we're so close to it that we can't see what it is. God sees it. So, in a way, we have to do it exactly His way. He does that. He. He wants us to follow His voice and to do it His way, because then it'll get done rightly. He is creating something through His people. He is making a body. Now we are representative of the body of Christ on this earth. What does that mean? And what is it exactly? Well, we can see the beginnings of this in Genesis when God deals with Abraham, well, actually, Abram, that's when God began dealing with him. His name was different. God changed his name later because the man himself had changed. And God gave evidence of it. In Genesis 15, beginning in verse 3, Oh, no. We have to do verse 1. I can't even believe this. I read it earlier, but... And then, you know, I'm listening. So God says, verse 1. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram replied, O oh Lord God, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Abra, Abra, Abram continued, Behold, you give me no offspring, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And then the word of the Lord came to Abram, saying, This one will not be your heir. But the one who comes from your own body will be your heir. And the Lord took him outside and said, Now look to the heavens and count the stars if you can, if you're able. And then he told him, So shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord. He believed him. He drank in that promise right there. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Your righteousness is in your believing God. 
The Lord also told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur and the Chaldees to give you this land to possess. Now he reminds him of what he formerly gave him, and we're going to read that. But Abraham replied, Lord God, how can I know that I will possess it? Now I want to say this, asking God questions, and you should, is not doubting him. If you think it is, you've been incorrectly advised by yourself or perhaps by others. You may ask God as many questions as you need to finally have the truth of what he said settled in your heart. The fact that you are asking questions of God about the things that he said is evidence that you are listening to what he said and taking it in the process of taking it inside. Sometimes taking in what God has said is a process. And the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So Abram brought all these things to him and split them down the middle and laid the halves opposite to each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. And the birds of prey descended on the carcasses, but Adam drove them away, because this is a holy offering. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and suddenly great terror and darkness overwhelmed him. And then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain, now he's coming at him again, about the same thing that he told him before. Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not their own. And they will be enslaved and mistreated for four hundred years. But I will judge the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will depart with many possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, is that not fascinating? There was a level of sin that had to be completed in a certain people. Now, all of this sounds very confusing if you've been taught that God doesn't have anything to do with evil. He doesn't, but he created the evil one, and he knows very well what the evil one is up to. And the acts of the evil one provoke God in certain areas, okay? And they provoke God's people in certain areas. The sin of God's people allows sin to abound in other places. And there is a point at which, because God is perfect in his responses, there is a point at which sin can reach a level where then a reaction takes place. And God, there's a reaction coming here because the Amorites had not yet fulfilled this complete completion of the sin. You know, God lets certain things go until time is up. Well, who determines time is up? He does. Okay, so God is very aware of the sin that's going on around. He knows. It is allowed for different reasons. We have an adversary because we need one. Without that adversary, who is a genuine adversary and an entity that can cause, let's just call him a worthy adversary. He's unworthy, but he's worthy. He's a worthy adversary. You cannot outthink the devil. You cannot outsmart the devil. What you can do is keep yourself under the shelter of the Lord Most High and under his protection. 
and then the evil one is vanquished. You can stand your ground in the Lord. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So our Lord fought the battle that was needed for the redeeming of our soul and the total victory over the enemy. But we have to stand our ground in this realm against the enemy who hasn't left the ground. He has been charged against. He has been cast down from whatever it was he was. He has been defeated by the Lord, but he has not left the stage. And therefore, we, standing in him, enforce the judgment upon him. But if you think that means that you're to be in denial against evil or what the devil is doing, you're wrong. You need to pay attention and you need to stand your ground and press back with what God has given you to press back with. You cannot allow his work to go on around you and be in denial or apathetic. There are so many false doctrines that have gotten into the body that are working against the body. There are tricksters that can enter your own body, diseases that will trick your body into thinking that they're part of your body and not really an enemy. And that's what we have going on in, in the body of Christ now with the devil and with evil. Oh, that's not really so bad. Oh, you know, I don't have to do anything against that. And evil is allowed to flourish around us and in churches and all kinds of places. And we don't stand against it. We have to change the way we think. We have to conform it to what God has said. Okay, so we will then know, God will be able to tell us then. You see, if you have a tradition of believing that a certain something is okay, and everybody else around you believes it too, even though it's not okay with God, you're not going to be able to hear God to do something about it. And you're not going to have the strength to do anything about it because you don't believe you're supposed to. So a great deal of bad behavior is going on around and nothing is being done to stop it because people think they have to tolerate it or they think they have to, no matter how much evil is caused as a result of it, they just seem to be, the body of Christ seems to lack the will to take care of what Jesus bought us, which was the victory. Okay, so we're in the process of changing our thinking here and getting ourselves in agreement with God. And when that happens, many things begin to come to light. In other words, you begin to see differently. When your heart begins to conform to God more purely, you will begin to see differently with your eyes because your eyes, your perspective, is shaped by your heart. Yes, you first begin to see with your heart and then with your eyes. You think you see the truth with your eyes, but you don't. You see a certain way, but you don't see God's way until you have God's way in your heart, and then you begin to see God's way. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, verse 17, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the halves of the carcasses. Abraham's obedience to God making a sacrifice in just this way, with blood on both sides, gave God a way to come in, because that was a type of sacrifice of the Lord, and the blood was a type of the atonement, and the symbol of it was enough for this thing that God wanted done. So a flaming torch, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, appeared and passed between the halves, of the carcasses. So God accepts the sacrifice and burns it himself. On that day the Lord made a covenant. So a sacrifice by God is done here and God makes a covenant with Abram saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, 
Perizzites, Raphaites, ooh, these were giants, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergesites, and Jebusites, probably a lot of them were giants. The children were told when they entered the Promised Land, do not think that it is because of your wonderfulness that you are being given this. He said, I am giving you this land because of the sinfulness of the citizens of the land who were being disposed, depo deposed. Well, they were also being disposed. disposed of. But they were being deposed. Now these, these peoples were terribly against God and God was giving that land to his people. It's just what he does. All right, now, we're gonna go here to Genesis 12, verse one. Okay, Genesis 12, verse one, starting in verse one. Now, this is, this is also the covenant that was given earlier, and this is how God began with Abram. Now, I do believe that this is how God begins with all of us. Then the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your kindred, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. God is doing a new thing. He's making you a new creation. That means that you will be surrounded with elements like an atom that are of him. What you've been around, generally speaking, very few people actually grow up in godly homes. Most people don't who come to God. But there are a few that do in which case you've already got a body that you're associating with and you would not need to leave your country and your it's he's basically saying you're going to leave what's familiar to you but i need you to disconnect from these relationships and from what has a hold over you and from what has kept you in a certain doing your traditional way of doing everything he was he's coming right at it he is coming at the traditional way of doing everything with Abram and his, all of the relationships that he has. And go to the land, I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. Now we know later he tells him to go look at the stars. So he expounds and magnifies the blessing as it goes along. And this is only the beginning of it because we'll eventually be going through Isaac and through Jacob with regard to this blessing. So you see how it develops. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had directed him. Now that was the promise. We see in verse, in, uh, in chapter 15, where God then makes a covenant. Now it's a super promise. So the promise became a super promise. So Abram departed as the Lord had directed him, and Lot went with him. Now this is very important. Certain things don't happen until the pieces that Abram was told to do begin to fall into place. As long as Lot is with him, there are certain things God can't do. So when those things are taken care of and Lot is no longer with him, then God begins to move on Abram differently or more fully. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. And Abram took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions and people they had acquired at Haran and set out for the land of Canaan. And when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the Oak of Moreh at Shechem. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram 
and said, I will give this land to your offspring. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Okay. So God begins an extraction, which is exactly what he does to us. He extracts us. He separates us. It's called sanctification. You are sanctified unto God and separated out of where you were. Psychologically, physically, and in every way, he wants to change you to him. His plan. And he does have a plan. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5. Starting in verse 17. Sixteen, so good. Can't miss it. Sixteen. So from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Neither did Jesus, by the way. Although we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Don't regard Christ according to the flesh any longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. You are in the process of becoming a new element to God. Your atomic structure, right down at the very base, is altering and altered. God's already begun the process, and the transformation is in place. I have to read this too. This is so good. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. That's what's happening. That's the peace. The peace is the reconciliation of you to God, who is also Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You have the ministry of peace and reconciliation. You're reconciling people to God. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Reconciling God. Reconciling the world. Okay, this is important to, we're going to ponder this in a second. Not counting men's trespasses against them. Now that's not an automatic. You have to receive him to get that. And he was committed to us, the me and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Everybody is not automatically forgiven of their sin. God does it, but you have to... See, there's a caveat. This um, another false doctrine, and boy, you hear this one everywhere. This is a false doctrine in the world and in the church, and I hear it said time and time and time and time again, is unconditional love. Why do they need to say that? But to a child of God, love would be just God's love, and whatever God deems as love, and God doesn't deem love what you think love is. God deems love what he says God's, God God deems love what he says love is. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. That's God's love. But well, that's not what a lot of people deem love to be. And that certainly isn't unconditional love, is it? The other thing is, if it was unconditional love, why are people going to hell? Why do people go to hell? How confusing that is. And a charge is brought against God by many people. How could a loving God do this? You think God has to bow to your opinion of what he thinks he should do? Are you serious? <laughs> That's just ridiculous. I'm sorry, but it is. It's ridiculous. We are living in a construct that was constructed to drive us to God. Some people never get there. And that's the way of it. We are told about it in the Word, that there are those who will perish. They're going to perish. That doesn't mean that you don't give them every opportunity that you can. 
because everybody needs to be treated as though they are going to come. So you do, God doesn't tell us who the dead are, the terminally dead. We know who the dead are because they're not alive in Christ. I call them the great unwashed. They're unwashed in the blood of Christ. <laughs> and they are dead, but they're to come alive. But there are those who are the dead dead. They're not going to come alive, and it doesn't matter what you do. And they will end up somewhere else. We need to get God's understanding of what His love is, okay? And we need to be separated from our old self and our old life so that we can inherit the promises that were given to Abram and Abraham. Let me just say this. I'm going to go on to Galatians 6 for just a minute here. Galatians 6. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So he's changing our mind. We need to change our mind. We need to let go of old teaching, bad teaching, and get ourselves centered up on what the Word of God has to say by the Spirit of God, not by man. So much of the teaching that's in the church now is just people, their ideas, and not given by the Spirit of God what God has said, not trusting it. They reinterpret it. Most people will interpret what they hear. It goes through a filter. With some people it's more obvious. You would say something and they would do something entirely different and you would say, how can they have gotten that out of what I said? because they were interpreting what you said. They decided you meant something else when you didn't say something else. What is that? Well, there's something else going on in there, a filter of some sort. That has to get removed from us with regard to God. We have to get rid of that filter. Now, that filter in our mind is laid there by bad teaching. Wrong assumptions about what we've heard. And the repetition of it and the believing of that in preference to the Word of God. We have to prefer the Word of God to our assumptions or our presumptions or we're living still in a state of sin. This is part of our separating from our old self. You have to separate from your old way of thinking and become renewed and Paul talks about this. You're going to become renewed. By spending time in the Word of God, you will become renewed in your mind. Your mind will no longer think the same way, and you physically will no longer see the same way, and you will no longer hear the same way. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now sometimes we take this and we say, faith cometh by hearing, and then your hearing is going to come by the Word of God. Well, that is true, but it is also true to read it this way. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've got to hear it, you've got to hear it, you've got to hear it, you've got to hear it. I have read over passages in the Scripture and watched myself jump over it without giving it weight. And I would say, what did you just read? And I would go, I don't know. So I'd read it again, and then I'd say, okay, what did you read? And I'd go, I don't know. And then I'd think, why are you doing this? Something, I'm blocking something. So I go back and I read it again. And this time I read it very slowly, and I intentionally put what's being said inside, and God starts to talk to me. There's a lot of things that we gloss over, read over, think we already know, and it keeps us blind. You gotta, your old self is a trickster. Your old self was used by the devil to keep you blind for a long time. Well, he's not done trying, believe me. He's still at his old tricks. 
You have to get smarter than him by trusting God more than he has a voice in you, than the devil has a voice in you. You have to trust God more than the devil's voice in you, you see. And you will erase and repel him and unlock secrets to your own heart that will amaze you because it will be God's voice firsthand on your heart. Incredible. He will awaken you to his majesty, but you have to make the effort. Now, effort of heart, as I have taught before, is much more difficult than working. If you want to go out and mow an acre of land, that is a lot of work. And there are people who do it all the time. But making an effort of heart is harder because you are going to have to, that is work. Your effort to believe Jesus Christ is the work that God has given you. And it requires effort of heart. And it is harder than any physical work that you will do. Often physical work is a distraction. It can be. And it is used by people to keep themselves from having to take the time to make an effort of heart to see things God's way. Okay. Galatians 6, starting in verse 14. But as for me, this is Paul, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who walk by this rule, even to the Israel of God. We are the Israel of God. There is an Israel that isn't in Israel, that is of God. He says in verse 17, From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. <laughs> Oh, Paul had been through it. Matthew 10, verse 34. Now, what they did in this collider, collider, in order to reveal what was underneath, was they created an explosion. And oh, it revealed a lot of stuff. Tremendous, tremendous things. And explosions tend to do that, you know. I've had quite a few explosions in my own life that have revealed a great deal. Uh, I've had situations, many situations, where I came on the scene and everything changed. And there was a little snap, crackle, and pop in the room and some rather undesirable characteristics from some people became revealed because there was an explosion entering the room, a different charge. A charge had entered the room that created a response and that response wasn't necessarily good. I mean, it didn't feel good. Well, let's just say that it could create a disturbance and has done on more than one occasion. But I also bring the peace of God with me wherever I go, and I insist on it wherever I go. So therefore, I'm undoing the works of the enemy. Matthew 10, starting in verse 34. Now this is our, this is our Lord speaking here. Do not assume that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Okay, y'all, how many times have you heard 
or read or been told that it's gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and that he only came to bring unconditional love to everybody. Well, he's not telling us that here at all. That is not what he says. He brings peace and a reconciliation to those who believe him. But what he's bringing to the world, and he tells us from the, toward the end, before he goes right to the cross, he says, I don't pray for the world, but for those that you sent me, Father. He's not praying for the world. He's praying for those that the God, that God sent him, the ones, the called ones, the ones that are his, the ones who don't know it yet, and the ones who do. Do not assume that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And then he goes on to say something very remarkable, and a lot of people just gloss over this one, because this is intense. I'm talking about leaving your home here, and what I'm saying is, there's a priority. You can leave your home without leaving your home. If God doesn't tell you to go somewhere, and he doesn't tell most of us to go somewhere, most of us remain in the places where we were, but we become different. We have preferred him over our circumstances and over where we are. And if we don't meet with too much resistance by those around us, then we can sometimes remain there. Other times we're driven away. And the enemy is real good at driving you away because you don't fit anymore where you were. So sometimes that's what happens. He drives you away. But he's doing God's work. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Yes, the enemy serves God too. And that sounds terrible, but it's true. Up to a point, the enemy does. The enemy is doing, he's against God. Everything obeys God. That which doesn't obey him intentionally with their whole heart, but is only doing it because they have to, those are the enemies. Those are the people in the enemy's camp. The children of God sometimes will go ahead and not want to do it and come around to God's way. That's true, but there is, there is an, in God will make people do what he wants them to do. There are people in the enemy's camp who will serve you as a child of God and they won't even know what they're doing because God will orchestrate it. Okay, so, you know, I see this. This is something that, and we can see, I can see, and I believe that I've seen in scripture, the scriptures that support that. Jacob is told this, his, Joseph is told this, that his brothers will serve him. Anyone who loves his mo father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Ah, who are you going to listen to and who are you going to obey? If you're obeying your mother and father more now, there is a time to be under the mother and father where you do obey them. But once you are an adult, you are to obey God. God says you're to obey your parents until such time as you become accountable, and then you're accountable to God directly. But God has already said to obey your parents up to a point and a time. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me. Now, he wrote this long before the actual cross came about. And I have wondered many times what the people thought who were listening to him say this. Well, they glossed it over, kind of like the dog in the mirror thing. They looked at it. They didn't see what it was. And they turned their head away because they couldn't comprehend it. They couldn't see it. Didn't want to see it. It was bothersome. And anyone who, and these are hard sayings, if you're tied to these things, it doesn't mean that you don't love your parents. He tells us 
in other scriptures that you're to honor your mother and father, and you are. You honor them with your love and affection. You honor them with your time and your means if they need help. You honor them, but you follow him. You follow the Lord. That doesn't mean you don't do your responsibilities. It doesn't mean you don't... It means you're not bowing your knee to them. It means you're bowing your knee to the Lord. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And what is that cross? Well, the cross is our death. How do you take up your death and follow him? Well, he's our life. What is our death? Take up my cross. That is the end. The cross was what he was pinned to. There was a shame involved there. He shamed for us. He was shamed for us, so we don't have to experience it. The cross is the difficulty. It is the walking out of this life that is not easy. And as a Christian, you have great blessings in God. Tremendous. We have all of our needs met in Him. But there is a price that we will pay on this earth in order to follow God that is the cross. That's the price that we pay for this. And it will make you a sharer in his death. And Paul calls it, I am a sharer in the suffering of Christ. Yes, it says he was a man, and Lord Jesus was a man, well acquainted with grief. This world will make you sad. The people who won't come to God the people who continue bent on destruction, the ones who hurt you, the ones who hurt other people, the ones who hurt people you love. All of these things are such sadness. There's great evil here. This is not a, um, this is not an easy place. So your cross is the price you pay for that. And it's the willingness to pay it. It's the suffering. It's the, it's, the, um, it's the understanding that is painful that you get and you hold. And the love of him that you walk in that causes you to suffer, many times to suffer. He says, whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What does that mean? Are you supposed to work yourself to death for God? Well, actually what you're doing is you're working yourself to life because you are exchanging that which is of the world for that which is eternal. There's an exchange going on. And you want that exchange to be more in favor as you go along of the eternal because you're leaving this place, you're just not out of it yet. You're leaving it. So you are escaping its hold on you as you continue to pick up your cross and walk this walk. Whoever finds his life will lose it. What are you losing? You're losing your old life. Abraham found a life that he did not have as Abram. He lost his life to find his life. And he had faith in God, his faith in God. See, God gives his love and those of us of faith reach out and through God's promises we lay hold of that love and we are activated. Oh, we are activated. Those of us that are transforming to the power of God and it is a power that he imparts to you 
as you continue to follow on his way. Are exchanging our old self for the new. The old self was under the power of the enemy. The old self is a thief and most people don't understand that. They don't understand that they were thieves before they came to Christ. If you don't know of any other sin that you committed, if you think that you hadn't done any of the great sins, understand that many people are thieves of other people's rights and they don't know it. They will steal the rights of another person, they will steal their integrity, they will steal their virtue, they will steal their stuff occasionally, uh, and maybe if they don't do that they will try to dominate and take over another person's soul and not even realize what they've done. Someone who tries to steal the mate of another person, coveting, wanting. Now God says, our Lord says, that if you want these things in your mind, you've done them already. That's a thief. The projection or the attitude is already creating a problem that you don't see. You don't see it, so you think it's a nothing. God says it's a something. God says if you hate your brother, you've already committed murder. You haven't done anything, but you have. These things in the heart, lay, they are not a nothing. They are a talking that's already gone forth from you simply because of the desire. The desire has created a shift, a change in the atmosphere. You don't perceive it, but then we're very dull in many ways. We are not awake to many things. So you have to understand that before you have him in your heart or before you have him in an abundance in your heart, you're dangerous. You've got to get his fruit in there. These things all have to change. So that stuff goes. That stuff goes. In Acts 26, we get to read or hear about Paul who testifies before Agrippa, which is fabulous. Paul, the Lord's servants who are our brethren, that we will see again. There are so many great ones, and Paul is right there. Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. And then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, now isn't that interesting? So he goes like this, King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today to defend myself against all the accusations of the Jews. Actually, it was more than that. He yearned for it. He was headed for this. Especially since you are acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies, I beg you, therefore, to listen to me patiently. So he gives honor to this man to lay hold of his attention, to get the man to come into a place Paul is speaking life, and he doesn't want any of this to be lost. He has paid a great price to get himself in front of this man. Surely all the Jews know how I have lived in the earliest days of my youth. Among my own people and in Jerusalem, they have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I lived as a Pharisee, adhering to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I stand on trial because of my hope in the promise that God made to our fathers. The promise our 12 tribes are hoping to realize as they earnestly serve God day and night. It is because of this hope, O King, that I am accused by the Jews. Why would any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? So then, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that I could to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is what I did in Jerusalem. With authority from the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were condemned to death, I cast my vote against them. 
I frequently had them punished in the synagogues. I tried to make them blaspheme. In my raging fury against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. In this pursuit, I was on my way to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen from me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles, I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those sanctified by faith in me. Jesus talked then to Paul, and he's talking now to us. Prophecy is now, then, and to be always. So he's talking to us right now. That's the power that was given to Paul, and you can hear it in his letters. If you open yourself to it, it's the very same thing. There is a power there in those words because they are given to him by God in order to open the eyes and to turn from darkness, that people will turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that people will no longer be thieves. See, you're stealing always if you're not in God because God has provision for you in everything and it's not a theft. He gives it. But when you're outside of the covenant, everything is a theft. There's an imbalance being created. It's all a theft because you're taking what you have need of or you're taking from other people and you're taking from God. There's a debt being incurred. So we have to get out of debt and into God. Pretty powerful, Paul's testimony. Paul was taken out and away from everything that he knew. And he, he knew what he knew really well. That's what he was trying to say. He was ensconced firmly in that old life. And there was an explosion and nothing was ever the same. Paul was forever changed, and Paul became what God desired him to become. He was called, and he said yes. Praise be to God. God testifies in the smallest, in the tiny places, in the quiet spots. God is talking. Everything's talking. There is no reason in this world to ever be bored once you've come to God. It is a fascinating place. You begin to see with new eyes and you begin to realize that God is putting on a show for you. He loves you. And His love is the God particle. It will energize you. It will juice you. It will put you over. His love is changing you and making you the one that he has in mind by his word and by the fruit that's being produced in your heart. 
I have meat you know not of, Jesus said to his disciples, to do the will of my Father. It nourished him. so beautiful. The will of our Father needs to be our delight. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Father, everyone within the hearing of my ear and my mouth, <laughs> everyone within the hearing of my ear, everyone within the hearing of my mouth as well, Lord, bless them. Sanctify them. Separate them to service, Lord, by your Spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. That we fit rightly, each, people, each person, each people, all the people that are hearing, each person fit rightly in exactly the place where God has them and they won't miss it. that part of the body which nourishes and produces according to what God has said. Make it so, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>